Hello, good afternoon. My name is Ashley evans Not. I am from Curve Lake, but I'm currently living in Peterborough. I would like to first welcome everybody and thank everybody for joining. And I'd like to mention that we're having a quick Q&A at the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions, please hold them off till then. Um, hi, hello, my name is Danny and I am from Curve Lake First Nation and I currently live in Lakefield. Um, first, I would like to intru introduce you guys to our friends Josh and Tanya, who are going to give you some more information as to why we're here and tell you some background information on Treaty 20 Partnership and the Friendship Report. Right on, thank you so much, ladies. Um, hi, everyone, my name is Tanya Taranjo, and I'm Dene from the Northwest Territories. But I'm speaking with you today from Edmonton, Alberta, a Treaty 8 territory. And I'm really honored to be sharing this information with you today and honored to be presenting with Josh and Ashley and Danny as well. And thank you so much for taking the time to, and the interest in what we're going to be speaking about today. I'm just going to uh, share my screen and show you a few slides so you can get some visualization about what we're talking about today. So we're talking about a friendship accord that was signed in the Peterborough area. I'm going to share uh, some information about the program that brought this friendship accord together. I'm going to talk about what friendship accords are, and I'm going to talk about wampum belts and the wampum belt that was uh, created or developed for the friendship accord in the Peterborough area. So what you're seeing right now on, on your uh, screen is the SETI logo and the Can Do logo and FCM. SETI is a program that was started over seven years ago with CANDU and FCM. CANDU is a native uh, or indigenous nonprofit organization that is, uh, stands for the Council for the Advancement of Native Development Officers. And together with FCM, and FCM stands for the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, they created this amazing program that has the acronym of SEDI, C-E-D-I. And SEDI stands for the Community Economic Development Initiative. And this program is a program that brings together First Nations and municipalities across Canada to form a new relationship, a, an economic development partnership that is based on friendship. And what was so amazing was First Nations and Peterborough area communities applied to this program how many years ago? And Josh and I, who you'll get to meet in a minute, had the privilege of working with this partnership we fondly refer to as CHOPS because in the end there were so many local communities involved in it together. And the reason why we called it CHOPS was because we had Curve Lake First Nation, Hiawatha First Nation, OSM in this partnership, Peterborough County, and Selwyn uh, Township. And so it just made it so easier for us to call them CHOPS and writing it out. But at the end of this partnership, everyone loved the name of CHOPS. So uh, over three years, Josh and I uh, were kind of like the, the facilitators, the, the lead um, of the SETI program to assist these communities in developing this relationship and getting to the end of, of prioritizing and developing a community economic initiative. But this program is so much more than that. It's about collaborating together, bringing communities together, bringing leaders together, and, and, and in addition to reconciliation. So over the course of three years, and I, I was just reduced my screen size a bit, many partnerships together in the program decide to develop an agreement together, a formal framework that really defines how they're going to work together and what the purposes of working together is. But because 
they develop this really unique relationship over three years. It becomes some, some communities adopted as a friendship accord, which really speaks more than just an agreement because it's communities coming together and saying how they're going to be friends. And if you see the screen right now, the image on your left is the, the graphic representation of the friendship accord that was created with the CHOPS partnership. And they, they, they um, came up with a name together for the Friendship Accord, and I apologize, maybe the ladies can say it later because I don't want to say it and dishonor it, but what it means is the way we are friends. And it's such a beautiful way for the community. They, they develop this from the images that you see to the every word and the purpose, their vision, their process, and their guiding principles. And it was so important to them that um, over a year ago, uh, just this month, November 2nd, 2019, they got all of the community leaders and the youth, the youth who introduced uh, us and started off this presentation today, Ashley and Danny, to come and sign the Friendship Accord and honor those words that they, that they set forth, this framework to strengthen and enhance and honor their historical, political, social, and cultural relationship that they formed together. And not only did they do that, but throughout their uh, working together and developing the words of that friendship accord, they, just, they decided it just wasn't enough, that they also wanted to have a wampum belt made that honored that agreement. I'm going to go back to the the Latin previous slide, because I want to point out that within this graphic design of their friendship accord, you see those diamonds in the middle. There's two white diamonds in the middle. There's two red diamonds, followed by uh, two white diamonds. Those represent the communities in this partnership. And the red diamonds are the two First Nations in the middle. As well, if you notice, the four directions are represented, as well as the medicine wheel. And, and the black in the background is the great spirit or the great mystery, really honoring this partnership. So they took those designs and, and that the meaning of the wampum belt. And for those who are not familiar with what a wampum belt is, um, wampum belts were traditionally used to uh, record laws or events or agreements or even treaties between uh, local nations and between big countries across uh, globally. And the one you see here at the bottom is actually uh, the Hiawatha Belt. And the Hiawatha Belt is one of the most recognized belts out there. Uh, it symbolizes the agreement between five original Haudenosaunee nations and their promise to support each other in unity. And the central symbol that you see in that belt is a tree. It represents the Onondaga Nation where the peacemaker, peacemaker planted the tree of peace under which the leaders of the five nations buried their weapons. And the four white squares from left to right representing the Seneca, the Cayuga, the Oneida, and the Mohawk tribes. And the lines extending from the tribes stand for a path for which the nations would follow as they agree to live in peace and join the Confederacy. So just understanding that historical um, way that wampum belts really recorded those important agreements, the, the CHOPS partnership so that the graphic design of what they wanted wasn't enough, that they wanted this traditional representation of this friendship accord, the way they were going to be friends forever, starting at this point, November 2nd of last year. And you see that those red diamonds are in the middle of the belt, representing the first original First Nations, Curve Lake and Hiawatha, who joined this friendship accord. And the, the white um, diamonds are representing the non-Indigenous communities that joined. So we had uh, OSM, Selwyn, Peterborough County, and PCAD who who signed up. But when they made this belt, 
if you look at the edges, that it, it's there's lots of string left on each side. And that's because early on in this partnership, they decided that it wasn't enough just to have them. They were great to start as partners together, but they wanted to grow this partnership. So those strings are there purposely for the future generations, the youth, the future leaders, to invite other communities to join in this friendship accord, to work together, to collaborate for a better community for all. It was just so amazing that, you know, this started with a program called SETI and brought these people together. And together they made this, you know, I have to emphasize that, you know, although Josh and I were facilitators in the program, it is the community leaders, the senior staff, and the youth who really visualized what they wanted for the future, and they made this happen. And we're just so honored to share the information uh, with you here today. And from there, I'm going to hand it off to Josh to continue sharing uh, about this amazing friendship accord. Thank you, Tanya. It's uh, bringing back some really fond memories. You did a beautiful job of explaining what those two things represent as well. Um, I'm calling in today from where I grew up, which is uh, Dawson Creek, BC, in northeastern BC, uh, in Treaty 8 territory. But um, because I love uh, Michisagi territory so much, I'm going to try and introduce myself in uh, Anishinaabemwin, which Ashley and Danny did vet. That doesn't sound too horrible. So here we go. Anim Bojo. Josh Rennie and Dishnikaz, Dawson Creek and Donjaba Besho Peace CB. So my name is Josh Rennie and I come from Dawson Creek near the Peace River region. So uh, what I want to do today, um, because our real uh, rock stars and, and all stars here in the presentation are Ashley and Danny, all I want to do is just tell the story of kind of how we got to where we are today um, as a partnership in the Peterborough area, Treaty 20 area. Um, and kind of building on what Tanya said, it's like the story of how these different partners became friends, which really is what's captured in that friendship accord. Um, and there's some interesting lessons along the way, which I'll point out as I go, but Tanya, can you pull the slides back up actually and just show the map of Treaty 20? Perfect, thanks. So you can see here in, uh, in Treaty 20, so we had some original communities that submitted an application to our program, which was Curve Lake, uh, Hiawatha, the County of Peterborough, and the Township of Selwyn. Um, but very early on, as you can see that on this map, uh, that's the Treaty 20 area. And within that uh, area is also Autonomy South Monaghan, who is the um, uh, geographic neighbor of Hiawatha, and also the Tree 20 map and the county of Peterborough's jurisdiction are very similar. And so from very, very early on, uh, the partners said, you know what, if we want to do this in the right way, we need all the relevant partners to be in the room, which is how this became CHOPS, as Tanya was describing. Uh, and the largest partnership uh, we've ever had in the SETI program with, with six different partners. And I think what's interesting to note about that when we first got together, which was in uh, Hiawatha, First Nation in 2017, I think it was. Um, uh, what was interesting to know is that a bunch of the people in the room didn't know each other, and the ones that did know each other didn't necessarily have relationships. This wasn't uh, this wasn't a group of people who were coming together who already totally liked each other, knew what was up, and just wanted to formalize something. This was a group of people who were trying something new, and I think there's an important lesson in that for any group of people who want to work across cultural lines and, and, and over over top of tough histories, um, that it doesn't start out easy and it didn't for this partnership. The very first time we met, some of the issues that uh, had been causing tension for some years came to the surface, which is, which is a good thing. But what happened was is that as we left that room on that, as we left that uh, community center at Hiawatha First Nation, there was a kind of question in the air about whether or not people were going to continue to come to this, uh, this uh, kind of process. And I'm really grateful to everybody who was in the room that day for having the follow-up conversations that they had and deciding that while it would not be easy, this relationship was worth investing in. Um, and I think there's a lesson there as well for anybody who wants to do this work, that it's not going to be easy. 
you're working with a challenging history. Uh, and one little moment in particular that I want to note from that first workshop was uh, each community got a chance to share their history uh, from their perspective of their community. And uh, what happened was the municipalities all started their story from the dates that they were incorporated as a municipality and their and it started from there and went forward, whereas the two First Nations, Hiawatha and Curve Lake, both started from time immemorial and talked about the seven grandfather teachings and the you know traditions that have been and laws that have been passed down to their people from so far long ago. And there was a moment uh, where the whole workshop had to kind of grind to a halt. One of the members in the room asked if he could smudge people in the room. And after he did so, he explained why that was so hard to witness, that half the people in the room were starting the history uh, hundreds if not thousands of years later than the true start of this relationship began. And so um, that set a tone for this partnership of realizing that there was a lot to learn about each other. So now if we jump ahead about four or five months, we're now in Curve Lake First Nation at the second uh, meeting. And uh, the tone was so different at this time. There had been a bunch of conversations that had happened in between. Um, and people really came to the workshop having a better sense of like, we might not know each other and we might not even fully like each other yet, but we are in this process and we see the value in it in the long run and we want to commit to it. And uh, some very fascinating and important things happened at that second meeting. One was... Um, one of the people who had been the source of some of the conflict at the first meeting actually brought some fish that he had fished over the summer and gifted it to the chief of Curve Lake at that point. And I think that was a, a turning point moment of, of honoring in a way that was very much kind of recognized and appreciated um, and, and starting to shift that relationship from like a business one to a friendship. Uh, Secondly, they watched, all the participants watched a video over the lunch hour that Curve Lake had produced about the history of Treaty 20, this land, and about the Michisagi people. And I think that sparked a real curiosity to say, we don't know very much as uh, non-Indigenous people in this territory. We don't know very much. And we got a long way to go in terms of learning uh, about this place. And that created a real curiosity that leads importantly into what I'm going to talk about in a minute. And lastly, they, they, they just got really down to business and said, these are the things we want to work on. And one of those things that they decided to work on was learning about each other and realizing why are we all in the room? And I think one of the people even said, there's too many gray hairs in this room. We need to uh, recognize we are here for the long term, for a better future for our young people. And we should not be doing that without young people's voices in the room. So a takeaway from that was that we want to work more with the youth in our community. And so the third time everybody got together, this is where I think the like tone and spirit of this partnership really shifted, was uh, there had been some work that had happened in the lead up uh, by some youth from Curve and Hiawatha. And Ashley, I believe you were one of those youth. Danny was not involved in this process yet. Um, but they had worked with Tracy Taylor at Curve Lake and Tom Cowie to put together a presentation on the history of Treaty 20. And I'm going to let the girls speak to that because they're going to do a way more eloquent job of that. But just to note that they came, they shared knowledge about the Indigenous history of this territory with chiefs, mayors, staff. And then they sat at a table with those chiefs and mayors and talked about what they would want to see represented in a friendship accord uh, that really sets up the spirit of this new friendship. And again, I'm going to leave the girls to talk about that in more depth. Where that led to was there was a few months there where the partners decided to take all that information that they got from those conversations and that workshop and put it into a friendship accord, which ended up being what Tanya was showing you earlier. But right from the outset, A, they said, we want to continue on in everything we do, making sure that there's a strong youth voice involved in this, guiding us. And secondly, is we want everything about this to be representative of both cultures that are engaging here. So the actual Friendship Accord ceremony that happened uh, really showed that it it had uh, dignitaries from, it had the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario who represents the Crown, uh, and it also had leaders of the Anishinaabeg Nation. Um, and the, 
the Association of Allied Iroquois Indians uh, there to sort of represent the political leadership of both uh, both sides. Um, and it opened with a youth drum group. And my personal highlight of the whole ceremony uh, was Ashley and Danny giving the kind of closing speech. There was a whole series of speeches from these dignitaries and they gave the final words before going up. And, and you can see here on the, on the slide, these are the chiefs, mayors and warden uh, signing the friendship accord. That's Chief Lori Carr there from Hiawatha. And look who's standing behind them. <laughs> Our two all-stars on the call today who uh, signed formally as witnesses of this accord to say, we are here, we are seeing this, we support this direction, and we are gonna watch it evolve into the future. This is important to us. Um, and just as a last thing, so the the following March, which just before COVID happened, actually two weeks before COVID happened, there was a final get together of this partnership within the program where the Wampum Belt that Tanya showed was presented. So um, that's the story of how this partnership built. But I think the really important aspect that we want to focus on today uh, is what that was like from the perspective of the youth who were involved and what your hopes and expectations for the future of this partnership are. So there's nobody better in the world to talk about that than the two of you. So I, I uh, pass that on to you. And thank you very much for giving Tanya and I time to, to share our part of the story. Although it looks like that timing might have been bad and there might have been an internet drop. <laughs> um, yeah. Should we go to the video and let them uh, maybe reboot? That's a great idea. Yeah. Okay. We have a, yeah. Thank you, Tanya. So there is a, a short five minute video that was developed by ISC, the Indigenous Services Canada, uh, documenting the process of documenting the process of the Friendship Accord. And we're just gonna go ahead and show that video now and allow the ladies enough time to reboot and get back to us. So Ashley and Danny, I don't know if you heard that, but we're just gonna show the video quick, which is about five minutes. Uh, okay. over to you. Okay. Tanya, just so you know, I can't hear any of the volume coming out of the. Can Ashley, Danny, can you hear the volume? I'm going to restart that. Just give me a moment. Uh, while you're doing that, I just want to note, uh, thank you, Dean, for the correction there. That was Ann Taylor that the, that, that the youth worked with, not uh, Tracy Taylor. My apologies for that mix up. Yeah, Tanya, I don't think, I think we're going to have a technical issue here because right? the volume, it, I can hear it now kind of coming through your computer speakers, but not enough to make it out. So we might want to postpone showing the video and Dean can add it to the presentation at the end and we carry on without it. We, yeah, we will either. Yeah, sorry about that. Go ahead, ladies. Okay. All right. Okay. So we lost power again. That's yeah. Sorry about that. Our power went out. So we're on the phone now, but so it's all, it should be fine. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, now that you guys have some background <laughs> info on the, um, <laughs> on the Treaty 20 partnership and the accord, I'm going to talk about my personal involvement in the Treaty 20 partnership. So back in 2018, I met Dean at a lunch and learn that was oh. held in the Curve Lake Resource Room at TAS. 
<laughs> um, he told us about the opportunity to be a part of this event that was happening for the 200th anniversary of Treaty 20. Um, it was being held in Selwyn. He didn't go into much detail about the event, but he told us that a small group of youth from Curve Lake and Hiawatha would be presenting a PowerPoint presentation in front of about 30 to 40 people. Um, at first, I wasn't planning on signing up because I don't like presenting, let alone in front of 30 people. Um, so it was a pretty nerve wracking idea for 16 year old me at the time. But after a bit of convincing, my friend Nadine got me to sign up with her along with our other friend Rebecca from Hiawatha. After the first couple of meetings, I got Danny to join with me as well. So basically the purpose of the presentation was to show the partners of the Accord what Treaty 20 is, um, explain how it impacted both Curve Lake and Hiawatha, and to explain how we as Indigenous new youth want to move forward together. So we ended up meeting about once a week for around a month to research and put together the PowerPoint. And during those weeks, we had the opportunity to sit down with Ann Taylor from Curve Lake and Tom Cowie from Hiawatha. And they were able to tell us stories and experiences people have had since the signing of the treaty. Um, I found it really interesting listening to them because prior to this whole um, partnership, I knew nothing about the treaties. So she basically was able to tell us how the community signing the treaties weren't fully aware of the agree agreements being made because they didn't understand English and how after they were signed that their whole livelihoods were basically taken from them. They weren't allowed to hunt or fish off reserve or out of season. So that resorted to them like sneaking off. Um, I'm really thankful I had the opportunity to sit down and talk with them and gain a better understanding about it. Um, presenting the PowerPoint wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. When we arrived in Selwyn, everybody was super friendly and greeted us as soon as we walked in the conference room. All of the partners seemed like they were looking forward to working with the youth. We were excited to present and share our ideas on how we as youth wanted to move forward with Treaty 20 and the partnership. Um, we stated that we want to continue to rebuild trust with our surrounding communities and that we think having the relationship through this accord would help us achieve that. At the end of the day, we were relieved that the presentation was over, but we were excited to start working with this really supportive and awesome group of people. Yeah, so um, about a year after the Treaty 20 presentation, um, Dean reached out to us again to inform us about the actual signing of the accord. Um, he told us we had the opportunity to speak about our involvement and we were thrilled. The ceremony was held at Lang Pioneer Village when we first arrived, I was introduced a lot to a lot of new people, including Josh and Tanya, um, and all the partners involved in signing the accord. We all started the ceremony by walking in together, being greeted by drumming and then welcoming prayer. Um, there were a few special guest speakers, and after them, each partner spoke about why the accord was important to them. Shortly after, Ashley and I presented our closing speech. This was really important to us because it allowed everyone to listen to the youth and hear our perspective. We as the youth think the accord is important for rebuilding trust within our surrounding communities. Our hopes for the Friendship Accord was to make more community connections. We want an open space for our communities to come together and share ideas. Ideas for joint, program, joint youth programming and workshops, as well as whatever ideas each community has to bring. Having youth from different communities come together is amazing because you have so many more ideas and so much more creativity to work with, which is why we were very excited to be a part of the Friendship Accord. Last but not least, we want to talk about our calls to action. With everything going on right now, COVID-19 and all, we recognize it has made things more challenging, but there are certain things we talked about at the signing that haven't happened. So what comes next for this partnership? We were supposed to plan an event to celebrate the anniversary of the signing, but it has been over a year now and there has been no plans made for the celebration. All the partners seemed very excited to work with the youth and we had wanted to create a youth outreach program that would be included in this partnership, but that is yet another thing that has not been followed through on since the signing of the Accord. There was also supposed to be the wampum belt that traveled through each community for a certain amount of time to remember what we started and to keep our connections strong. Sadly, we have not heard of 
um, of the partners following through with this either. We hope in the near future we are able to reconnect again and continue what we started. The whole plan was to rebuild and reconnect communities, and that is what we want to do. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to listen to us today. Please let us know if you guys have any questions. Thank you. So that was fantastic. Um, I'm gonna I'm going to start off with some of the questions, if that's all right. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Uh, when you spoke about reconnecting and the involvement of the youth. Do you, and, and this is open to anyone, are there specific ideas that you have in mind with activities or how this could look? Do you want me to I mean, Are we on mute? Yeah. Um, well, first, um, my hope and plan, which we had all touched on before, um, my main goal is want to connect the youth from all um and together just to form new ideas and to start um seeing what they do in their reserve or in their communities for workshops or teachings or programming like what type of programming they do and then get together and think about it and share all of our ideas so everyone can all do that together and come together one having our friendship together Yeah. Thank you much for that. I, I don't mind adding to that as well, Dean. Please do. So uh, one of my passions is Indigenous economic development. And I had shared a presentation on youth entrepreneurship uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And what came out of that presentation was that there could be, you know, a regional youth entrepreneur youth group that would support each other through, you know, starting a business or making a business plan or supporting local businesses. And it just seems so fitting because, you know, it started with SETI, which is a community economic development initiative. And small businesses are really the engine of local economies, you know, job growth and, and being a healthy community. So it would be so amazing to have Indigenous and non-Indigenous youth get together and like, what can we do together? And maybe even creating a peer lending circle, you know, just rising together. And I think that would be a great um, suggestion to, you know, build upon uh, with the youth's input. Josh, did you have anything to add? Are you are you, are you um, being discreet right now? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? We talked about this in the prep for the presentation, and my like, what I would hope would be the the outcome over the short medium term would be to have this partnership that's already been developed between the adults and the and the councils of each community, and then also have youth councils or youth groups from each community have their own relationships and then for them to figure out what that way is that they want to be in touch together because um what the way it's been left right now like danny just said it's a little ad hoc it's like it's relying on somebody to reach out to the youth to say here's how you want to be involved or here's how we'd like you to be involved but if there was something that was a bit more structured so that youth voice was always a part of any part of this partnership, I think that would be a really good thing moving forward. But that would require some level of, uh, um, I don't wanna say organization, but just some level of friendships and connections at the youth level that it feels like there's representative voices there that they could speak to as well. Perfect, thank you for that. Um, so I'm gonna go reverse now and, and, and start with Tanya and Josh. In, pointing out that this i think is one of the rare occasions with the work that you were doing with seti where youth were involved um and if you each of you wanted to speak to possibly why this is one of the few instances of youth having been involved and i know that uh neither of you are working with seti anymore but if this has had 
any lasting reverberations with the organization in seeking out um, youth leaders or the voice of the youth, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, because that, that truly is the future. So it's not, and, and it, to be inclusive as well is, is certainly our way. So if you had, what thoughts you had on that? And then uh, Danny and Ashley, you know, give you the heads up while, while Tanya and Josh are speaking. Um, I would like your reaction to, to what uh, they are going to be saying as well and how you think you'd be able to address as, as to youth representations, rep representatives, excuse me. Yeah, I, I don't mind starting, Josh. Um, it, it, you're absolutely right, Dean, that this is unique. Not only the municipalities and First Nations getting together, but as well, you know, involving the youth in it. And maybe not so unique to First Nation leadership because, you know, our, our if you want to say our Indigenous worldviews, our, our values and culture really honor the seven generations and thinking about our decisions today and how they're going to impact the youth. And it just seems so natural to include that. But it's really it's educating the municipality or the non-indigenous leaders that you know it's more than just saying the youth are our future. It's about involving the youth in our future and listening to them in those you know those key decision points that need to be made that are going to directly impact them. Um, one of the relate the partnerships that I was involved with in addition to Chops was. Uh, Enoch First Nation and the City of Edmonton partnership. And one of the ways that they had decided to celebrate their Friendship Accord, they didn't particularly involve the youth in creating the Friendship Accord or first signing it, but they they changed with, you know, as we learned within the SETI program and growing our process, that with the celebration, the one year anniversary of it, that they brought the two youth councils from each um, from Enoch you know, First Nation, from the city of Edmonton together. Actually, the youth got on the Edmonton city bus, drove out to Enoch First Nation, picked up the youth in Enoch and brought them to where they're celebrating, which is Rogers Place, the home of Oilers. And uh, they together, they celebrated with the leaders and exchanged gifts and talked about exactly what Ashley and Danny are doing here today. What are our hopes for the future, for how our leaders are gonna live up to the Friendship Accord? So in that way, I, I'd have to say that, you know, the ladies here involved with the CHOPS partnership really, you know, set the stage for what could happen in future partnerships. And it's just the beginning because, you know, it, it is their future and we need to honor what direction they wanna take us in. And with that, I'll pass it to Josh. Yeah, I think in every partnership, there's always an interest and a desire to have youth voices, at least that's spoken about. But I think what was different in this case was that uh, there were some people within the adult part of the partnership who were really, really committed to making sure that that was realized. And there was somebody like you, Dean, which I think is an important kind of middle ground role where there was a um, kind of somebody to that the partnership could go to to understand how best to do that. And then there was this these incredible human beings on the youth side of things who you know stepped up the plate and wanted to and just contributed so much and kept being involved. It wasn't a one-off thing. So I think. Uh, my guess is that most, especially municipal governments, are probably struggling with the question of how do we engage youth, less with do we want to or is it important, but it's more about the how. So, uh, you you know, the three of you and also uh, um, Rebecca and Nadine um, have shown an example and a model, in my opinion, of how the programs like the SETI program or anybody else who's not even a part of the SETI program, but just wants to do a better job of uh, working with youth, they could look to this and say, okay, um, it needs to be ongoing. It needs to be consistent. It needs to not be, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Where you take something and, um, I can't remember the word I'm looking for, but it, uh, uh, 
tokenism and that, that not be tokenism, tokenistic. Um, and I think where possible, where there's structural people like you, Dean, who have that responsibility and those re existing relationships, I think those are the places to start for, for governments to do that. Thank you, Tanya and Josh. So the younger part of the dream team, what are you, what are your what are your responses to to identifying some of the challenges and 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 possibly uh, the speed bumps in moving forward right now, aside from COVID? Um, that's a good question, Dean. <laughs> um, do you wanna? I mean, I think like Josh said, like definitely getting like the youth involved. Like, I'm just thinking. I know like a lot of the youth in like Curve Lake they all do things together kind of thing like do all the little programs or whatever get workshops. together at workshops out here i don't know like what kind of things they have like in town for that for like the non-indigenous people so i don't know how we could do that like for saying if we made like a youth group or youth council out there kind yeah, of thing and engage like, the youth yeah. together not just have them separated mm -hmm. like because this is what we want is to make friendships and not even just with non-indigenous youth like other like reserves like mm -hmm. Hiawatha like what we're trying to do here um yeah just engaging the youth but how do we <laughs> go about how? this um I think a huge thing is just like what Josh was saying is consistency. Mm -hmm. um, that's a huge thing for us right now. And especially just with everything going on, having something consistent and being reminded about this friendship accord and why this is important and why we're doing this and what we're doing it for, like to build better relationships. And we want to start going with this and start making our ideas for workshops and our ideas for programmings and everything like that. Um, but just keeping it consistent with our ideas and like if we start getting together or doing calls or however we're going to start all engaging together, um, just keeping it consistent. And I think it's really important that we have people like Josh was saying, people like Dean who bring us together in the beginning, really just help us form our relationships, which was really awesome. Um, and then get helping us get started so we can build on these ideas and learn how to go about this. Um, I'm not sure if the best plan like would be to reach out to the adults and the and like the all the partners in the signing of the accord or how we should exactly go about this but we definitely need to start figuring out our calls it, yeah. to action and starting on this um just our hopes and what we want to do and building these relationships and we don't want we put a lot of hard work into this friendship accord and into your treaty 20 presentation and all of this and right now it just feels like we're kind of stuck and we're at a Stand point still. yeah we're just at a standstill right now where we're just kind of seeing like so what comes next miigwech for that um and for the people that that, that are listening and watching i i want to let them know that not any of these questions were prepared beforehand, so <laughs> <laughs> you know uh, people are are are, are answering um, honestly, and and you know I don't mean to put anyone on the spot, but that honesty, that bravery that you're showing now, all four of you, is those are the key components to what made our collaborative relationship work, and that's going to lead into my next question, um, starting with Danny and Ashley. With this leadership opportunity, with, with your roles now as leaders, I wonder if you've had a chance to sit back and breathe and think a little bit about how it may have impacted your lives. Has it been responsible for any type of change in your, in your worldview, um, in how you see your futures, and how you see your communities? Um, mm -hmm. You know, just take a moment to, to think about it rather, you know, because it's been successful and you both have successfully graduated high school as well. So you have a that whole new stage of your lives now. Um, and how do you think this experience has changed you within that realm of leadership? Um, well, personally, um, I've always and I I'm. I think it's the same for yeah. you. We've always been um, 
super excited to work with other people and other communities, especially youth. Um, I think that was a really huge deal for us. So that was really exciting when we had the opportunity to be involved with all of this um, with you guys. It was a really exciting opportunity. Um, so it really just opened my eyes to how like it made us feel really mm -hmm. important yeah. <laughs> and just like really everyone was listening to us and wanted to hear what we had to say mm -hmm. um and that meant a lot um that really opened my eyes to like there are adults out here that want to know what we have to say they are here to listen to what we have to say and that's really exciting so that was a really big eye-opener to me because I had found like throughout school and stuff like I've I've always like to speak out <laughs> and be loud. Um, so I've, I have um, all of my life, but I feel like a lot of the times I would speak out on like indigenous issues or something. It was a lot of, I wasn't being listened to. Um, and so having all of these people and all of these adults who are very um, important people to me, listen to what we have to say and hear our opinions was really amazing and really eye opening. Because um, it was just wow, like I felt really respected and I was very understood. And that was amazing. Um, and then you fast forward to now. And I am a little bit disappointed with the um, outcome because we haven't, like we, our voices were heard and it felt like we were being listened to and everyone made it very clear to us that what we had to say was very important to them and how the youth played such a big role in this. And we told them why it was important to us. Um, and then now for there's not really anything else going on. Like, I feel like we're just in that standstill. That has been um, kind of disappointing to us um, just because what we had to say in the beginning was so important and everyone really wanted to hear about it and know what we had to say. And then now it's kind of just like shifting into the future and it's kind of just being fizzled out and dissolved. And it's so that's that's impacted yeah. us as well because yeah. it's like we what we had to say was important and you guys really wanted to listen but now here we are a few months later fast forward and it feels like nobody really like cares as much anymore so that's kind of my perspective on it right now um I mean yeah you pretty much said it all girl question again sorry Dean <laughs> <laughs> uh, no problem. Um, so Ashley, well, maybe you, the question was having, you know, inviting you to take the time to think about how the lead, this leadership role and these invitations to enter into the, these, this leadership role over the past two years, what, what you think of it. So has it changed your life? Has it changed how you, you view your community? Has it changed how you see yourself as, you know, part of a community um, that is re-entering into new accords and new understandings of treaties? And, and as you both were honest to say, you didn't have a lot of personal knowledge about treaties to begin with either. So, oh, are we back? Yeah, you yeah. cut out there. Okay. So again, just your um, really, Ashley, you know, a chance for you just to be reflective on on what impact, if any, did this the last two years working within the Friendship Accord have on your life and your and your worldview? Well, definitely, it has made me step out of my comfort zone a lot with all these presentations and everything, because throughout school I have hated presentations, completely dreaded them, but. I kind of look forward to them now. <laughs> They're not as bad anymore. Um, throughout this whole experience, I've learned a lot from pretty much everybody I've talked to with like Anne and the Treaty 20 partnership and all that. And then you guys. Um, I mean, I, oh gosh, I don't know. No, and that and that and that's fine. That's plenty, Ashley. That's better than fine. That's awesome. Because um, again, it, 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 it's a lot to process, right? Going through. Um, and as one of the people, one of the adults who's very lucky to work with you, um, you know, I can see with the two of you and, and we certainly, and I'm glad Nadine and Becca's names have been coming up as well, because the first step that you, each of you showed, which we need in leaders was bravery. And, you know, you took a leap, 
you didn't know me from a hole in the wall. <laughs> and, and so to, to, to trust me, to take that chance, um, the, and, you know, with all of us being uh, honest as much as we could and, and being kind with each other, you know, these are the attributes that we hope leaders have. So um, this is where, you know, Tanya and Josh and myself have always said all along how honored and humbled we have been working with you that you're listening to us. And, and that's how relationships um, stay healthy and stay strong. So I, I am deeply appreciative of that as well. And now I'm going to put Tanya and Josh on the hot, uh, on, on the hot seat. When Can I make one about, comment before you, are you going to ask another question, Dean? Okay, yeah, but go ahead. I was going to ask you, you know, Tanya a question, but go ahead. I just, just want, just on the note of what you were just saying, I just want to say also that, uh, Ashley and Danny, like your comments that you just made a minute ago are also examples of that bravery and leadership because you're saying in a very vulnerable way, you're saying this was important to us. We put a lot of work in us. We put our hearts into this and, and we don't feel like it's necessarily being held up as we expected. And, and, and you're like gently, but also very like lovingly calling out and saying, can we like get back on track here? Cause this is really important to us. So that's like an example of that leadership in action as well. Um, and I just wanted to say that, you know, I think what, one of the things that gave me the most inspiration in this whole process, uh, which was working with the two of you on the screen today and the other two that, uh, that aren't here with us today, um, was this like vision in my mind of like, no matter what paths you end up going down, I'm gonna pretend one pathway here in my imagination, which is like one day when we're reading about, you know, Chief Johnson or Chief Evans Knott in the in the paper, you know, and and the value of this process having been long term will be that you'll be in this position now where you have a role in your community, but you'll also know both the history of what how your where your communities got to, and you'll know people in the other communities as friends that you've been working together with for 10 or 20 years that changes the game from day one compared to where most communities are at. So to, I get very excited and very inspired when I think about what you've done, the investment you've put in and what it looks like moving forward, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 years from now, it's, it make, fills my heart up. I just wanted to say that. Thank you, Josh. Um, so my question now for you and Tanya, um, as, as the adults in this team, Looking forward, what guidance would you give to the adults involved, specifically in this project, but also moving forward in looking for caring adults to support um, our, our youth leaders? What what kind of uh, mind frame should they be in? What what acknowledgement of the gifts should they be putting in practice? Um, from your own perspectives to make these long lasting relationships and making them productive. Mm -hmm. You want to go first, Tanya, or you want me to go first? <laughs> you go first, Josh. <laughs> well, I'm just, uh, I have a book in front of me here with the seven, uh, seven teachings in it. Um, seven grandfather teachings, grandmother teachings. Uh, and I think that, in an ideal world, all seven are always in play in these situations, but I'm gonna highlight a few that I think um, adults in any of these kind of situations, but particularly this one that's already been uh, established uh, should be doing, and one of them is bravery. Dave, uh, Dave, oh my God, Dean. Uh, Dean plus brave equals Dave. Anyway, um, <laughs> bravery, um, but also humility. I think there's a lot to be said in what you just spoke about, Dean slash Dave, um, um, uh, around, you know, inviting youth voices into a process isn't, isn't just like a checkbox on a list of things you should do because it's, you know, quote unquote, the right thing to do. It's about being humble and knowing like your role as a caretaker of this moment, of your communities, of the world around you of those relationships and that there's a humility in knowing that other people will then step into those roles and to have those people involved at an earlier stage 
can't do anything but goodness in preparing that next uh, caretaker to come in. But the one that speaks to me above all of them is is the gift of of love. Um, and I think that's where the when I was speaking about that workshop where it kind of settled in on everybody's minds that they wanted to have youth voices involved. I think it really was coming from a place of love. It was uh, recognizing the like holistic nature of a partnership like this, that it's not just about chief and mayor and staff, it's about people and land and past generations and ancestors and future generations and all of those ancestors and in, in, in all those ways. So, um, I think kind of embodying that broader version of we're doing this because we love our community. We love the people around us, indigenous and non-indigenous. And this is not some isolated work thing we're doing. This is like a whole person thing. And, and these are other whole people with different perspectives that, that need to be involved in this process too. So those would be values I'd like to see embodied. That's so great, Josh. I'm, I'm so, um, I'm so honored to still be able to present with you, Josh, and honored that you went back to the seven teachings and brought them forward with that. So thank you. I think that's so important. Uh, to add to that, I would say to the adults is to revisit the vision that they so painstakingly put together word for word. Like me and Josh can tell you that there was if not tens of like 60, 70, 80 emails, hundreds of emails of what they wanted, I'm going to read it to you. Their vision is a partnership where we respectfully and collaboratively recognize our traditions and richness of culture and where together we share in a progressive, sustainable community with mutual prosperity achieved in balance with a preservation and precedence of Mother Earth and the waters now and for the next seven generations. And I would ask those leaders, those senior staff, what does that mean to you? And what are the steps you're going to take today, tomorrow, next year to honor that vision going forward? Beautiful. That was just absolutely beautiful. But you having that ready, Tanya, is gonna make it look like I teed this one up for you earlier. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's from the slideshow. I had it on my second screen. <laughs> Again, full disclosure, right? I'll just be completely explicit here that you know it wasn't set up. Um, so this has been wonderful. I, I I'm gonna give everyone a chance to you know give some final thoughts on the way out. We will say our goodbyes. I'll stop the recording, but I'd like all of us to stay on the channel after after I close the recording as well. So how about uh, Tanya, since we have you right now, if there's anything else you'd like to add to that, we'll go to Josh and then we'll go to Danny and Ashley and we will we will finish this up. Excellent, thank you, Dean. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Dean, Ashley, Danny and Josh for all joining together in presenting this information and sharing this knowledge. You know, it's, it's very uh, honoring of our traditional ways that this is where, this is how we share knowledge and pass it on to future generations. And for everyone who watches this video, you know, adults and, and youth, that this is still something to be celebrated. This is an amazing agreement. It is the way that they're, they're doing friends and there's, there's gonna be bumps along the way. There's gonna be ebbs and flows and peaks and valleys of that friendship. And, and the goal is to celebrate those peaks and get out of those valleys as fast as you can. And thank you very much, Masicho. I just want to say that it, you know, working with each of you has been like one of the highlights of my life for the last few years. And uh, I say I'm one of the luckiest people in the world because some of the moments I'll remember for my whole life happened in a quote unquote work context for me, but it didn't feel like that at all. And to be here today in a non work context uh, to me is just part of that. Um, Part of embodying that these are relationships we've built together 
and they don't stop when a job title ends or when a program's three years ends or whatever. And and I also want to then expand that idea out to everybody else who was involved in this from staff to mayors to chiefs to wardens to um, to other youth to literally every everybody that has been involved in this process at any stage it's like you've come into a, a circle of an, a web of relationships and those are beyond any title or anything like that so hold that up and and keep building what uh, what's been laid down by these amazing people thank you i'm just so privileged to be a part of it um, I just want to thank all of you guys <laughs> and everyone who's watching. Um, thank you for watching and listening to us, what we have to say today. Um, it's very important to us what we had to say. So thank you so much for being a part of this. Um, and thank you, Josh and Tanya and Dean, for just building these relationships with us and helping us continue doing this work with the Friendship Accord. This means so much to us and this opportunity is just so amazing and we're like we've been so excited since the beginning to start this process and it's been such an amazing process and we've developed so many amazing like friends and connections and we're just genuinely so grateful so I just want to thank you guys so much for that. I'd also love to give a little shout out to Dean. Oh, I just want to say thanks for being so supportive <laughs> over the past couple of years. You've really helped me out through that whole Treaty 20 process, hyping me up before each presentation. That really helped. <laughs> Thank you for that. And uh, thanks to Josh and Tanya for just being so welcoming and open to both of us. Thank you. Well, Chimi Gwach, Walaliak to everyone. Um, this, this has been uh, a fantastic session. And I am going to leave it there. And like I said, we're going to stop the recording and then we'll chat some more right afterwards. Okay. So don't go, don't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs>